Greetings DIYers and welcome back to the channel. In this week's video I'm going to present an old instructional movie I played for many years in my shop classes. It's all about steel, how it's made and how it's formed. Why learn about steel? Because it's amazing and every DIYer uses it as either a raw material or in its final product forms like tools or equipment. Knowledge of its properties makes it easy to understand why steel tools like the 1930s wrench on top outlasted its original owner, while the bottom wrench clearly didn't. The movie we're going to watch was made in 1936, but don't let that put you off. The reason I kept showing it to my classes over the years is because I've never seen a better visual presentation on the subject. It doesn't try to hide the dramatic and somewhat dangerous aspects to steel production and for that reason it's better than more modern works that try to gloss over those aspects with a bunch of PC babble. But before we watch it, let's go over a few quick terms that are essential to understanding this incredibly important metal. First, steel is an alloy of iron and carbon. But what's an alloy? Well, an alloy is simply a combination of two or more metallic elements. And if you're unsure what a metallic element is, just look around you. Just about every object you see is partly or mostly made of metallic elements, even you. In fact, most of the elements on the entire periodic table are metals, as shown here in gray. Now I said earlier that steel is amazing, but not just because of what you can do with it. It's also amazing, at least to excitable people like me, because of how it was discovered. In reality, steel discovered itself. Its main ingredient, iron, has been processed by man for thousands of years simply because it's found almost everywhere. That's because a lot of it is on the Earth's surface due to impacts from iron meteors. In fact, it's believed that a small planet struck the Earth billions of years ago, sending out debris that eventually formed the Moon, and scattering iron over the Earth's surface in huge deposits. So iron was easy to find, and it was mined and processed for centuries before metal workers discovered an odd thing about some of their products. It turned out that old furnaces exposed to lots of charcoal and carbon soot made better iron. That's because it was no longer just iron. The charcoal and the soot introduced carbon into the liquid iron, and when it cooled and hardened, it was stronger than pure iron processed in a cleaner environment. As soon as iron producers realized what was going on, they started controlling the process of adding carbon and even experimenting by adding other elements. And thus, the science of steel metallurgy began. So, how much carbon do you need for steel? Very little. Most steels have carbon content measured in hundreds of a percent. If you add 1% of carbon, or more than 1%, in fact, you can make steel that's so hard that it can be used to cut other lower grades of steel. Drills and saw blades, for instance, are made of steel with a carbon content uh, approaching 1% or even exceeding it. Once steel is produced, it needs to be formed into a useful shape. There's two basic ways of doing this, and you're going to see both of them in the upcoming movie. You can form metal into a useful shape by either casting or working. Casting is the process of melting a metal and pouring it or pumping it into a mold like you'd pour cake batter into a cupcake mold. When steel is first created, it's poured into massive molds that form it into a shape called an ingot. Ingots can then go on to other casting processes, or they can be worked, which means to reshape them by using machines to roll or pound them into a useful shape. When ingots are first worked, they are rolled into big blocks that are called blooms, billets, or slabs. These can then be further worked by rolling into thin sheets, or they can be made into complex shapes by processes like forging. When hot steel is in liquid form and poured into a mold to make a casting, it solidifies into tiny crystals called grains. So inside a casting, the metal has the appearance of grains of sand. These grains can't slip past each other, so they give the casting hardness and rigidity that resists bending. But because of that granular makeup, it's relatively easy for a crack between grains to propagate across a casting if too much bending force is applied. To make metal more bendy and more difficult to crack, it can be rolled or forged. This working process, if done correctly, will stretch the grains until they are long and fibrous like wood. Parts that are made by rolling or drawing will have grain that is so long that it allows the metal to bend repeatedly without breaking. 
In this high-tech example, I'm going to use my fingers to first represent worked metal with long grains that can slide over each other, allowing the metal to bend. But a cast grain structure demonstrated here will break if a bending load is applied to the part. But unlike wood, even worked metal can shorten its grain structure if you bend it too many times and too far, leading to an eventual break. One of the best examples I can think of to compare a casting to worked metal is an engine crankshaft, which are commonly made by both processes. A cast crankshaft is cheap and easy to produce and has very hard bearing surfaces that resist wear. But if heavy bending loads are applied, it's easy for a crack to travel across the part and cause a failure. A properly forged crankshaft, and by properly forged I mean the forging was done in several gradual steps with careful heat control, will allow a certain amount of twisting and bending loads without breaking. Many cars use forged crankshafts, but all aircraft engines do because an aircraft crankshaft twists constantly due to torsional vibration from the propeller and would quickly break if it was made from a casting. You might also hear the term billet applied to crankshafts or other car components. Now remember a billet is just a big block of metal that's been rolled from a cast ingot. If a crankshaft is made from a billet, it's cut into a crankshaft shape from a single block of metal. Now the original block has long grain structure, but if you cut across the grain to make a complex part like a crankshaft, there can be more paths for cracks to easily form along the grain boundaries. So a properly forged crankshaft is really the best choice for durability, but it will be higher priced. By the way, rolling or forging metal isn't the only way to make it more durable. You can also improve its characteristics by adding other alloying elements instead of just carbon. By adding other elements, you can make steel easier to work, easier to weld, and even more resistant to rusting. To identify what the alloying elements in steel are, steels are given code numbers. And there are way too many of these codes to go into here it's a really fascinating subject, and it's important to know if you work with steel on a regular basis, but I'm just going to mention a couple that you encounter fairly often. First of all, if the code for the steel you're working with has four digits, the last two will be the percent of carbon in hundreds. So, for example, if the last two numbers in the steel you're working with are 30, 30, then it has 0.3% carbon, or 30 one hundredths of a percent. The first number of a four-digit code indicates the main alloying elements. Now if it's a one series, meaning one followed by three digits, or the 1000 series, then it's plain carbon steel, meaning it's just iron with varying amounts of carbon added. For another example, a very useful steel that's very commonly used in the aircraft industry, we have 4130, 4130, and it's popularly known as chrome moly because the major alloying elements are chromium and molybdenum. If you're curious, molybdenum is added to increase toughness, and chromium is added to steel to make it easier to harden and to resist corrosion. In fact, if you have at least 10% chromium in your steel, it's called a stainless steel. Another popular alloy that you're liable to run into is called chrome vanadium or chromium vanadium. And you've probably heard of it because those words have been printed on tools since the 1920s. Again, in this case, chrome will increase the rust resistance and help the hardening process, but it also works with the carbon to improve flexibility that makes the tool harder to break. Vanadium is added to this steel to improve the hardening process. Now there are several four-digit codes for chrome vanadium steel, but the one that's most popular for tools is 6150. And the 50, of course, means that this steel contains 50 one hundredths of a percent carbon. Applying all this steel knowledge to a practical example, you can appreciate why a simple tool like a twist drill, or drill bit if you prefer, can have such a huge variety of prices. 
A cheap drill has less carbon to make it easier to produce. That also means it's less brittle and users who have lesser hand skills aren't likely to break them by doing simple home projects with soft materials like wood. But a high carbon drill is harder and more expensive to produce and will snap easily if an unskilled user applies a bending load. I advocate keeping a set or even several sets of low-cost drills around the house for general use by family members doing things like hanging pictures. I also keep a cheap set of number drills for my own indoor hobby projects, but in my shop I keep the good stuff. A small number of expensive drills I use for precision work, and if they ever get dull I regrind their points to keep them useful and accurate. The point is that both high-cost and low-cost steel tools can have their place in a DIY household. And now finally here's the movie. Steel production in all its heavy industry glory. The nation's history is far more a record of imperial victory than a saga of wars waged and battles won. Its greatness lies in glowing furnaces and smoking stacks, in skilled labor, inventive genius, and the spirit of enterprise that is so typical of America. And typical of the steel industry, literally the backbone of a thousand industries, is the panorama that reveals the magnitude of any one of the major mills where the manufacture of steel involves a tremendous investment. Here, before a worker can be given a job, the company by which he is employed has an average of more than $11,000 for each man employed, and that does not include wages. Incidentally, note one unusual feature of this industrial scene, which would not be found in any other country in the world. The automobiles are all work in the mills, men who are now rage rate in the history of the industry. Into such a center of activity, the raw materials are poured from train and ship, thousands of tons of coal made for the blast furnaces, mountains of iron ore, and vast quantities of limestone. They are charging a furnace, ore from which the iron is to be melted, coke to provide an intense heat in the base of the furnace, 
as a superheated air blast passes through it. Limestone to flux the impurities from the ore. Up to the top goes the laden Larry to feed one of these giants that may eat up as much as 3,000 tons of solid raw materials a day. Now they are preparing to tap a furnace at the base where they may draw off as much as 100 tons of molten iron at a time. An oxygen torch burns into a clay plugged hole, but no chance for injury on this job. That asbestos suit and helmet would protect the, any stray sparks or spatters. A thin stream of metal begins to flow, glowing liquid iron. The stream swells in volume, a fiery river if you ever saw one. But you, as an uninitiated onlooker, could not be expected to know that these men in charge are very much in command. With modern mechanical devices and highly developed safety measures that enable them to control the flowing metal with less danger to themselves than you face every day in your home or on the street. Today, the American steel mill is as safe a place to work as any industrial establishment. In fact, company after company has prided itself on winning safety trophies, which stand for a prolonged period without a single serious accident. A sample of the metal will be cast into a small block and cooled for a quick analysis by the metallurgical laboratory to check its quality. Meanwhile, the flaming river is directed through channels which lead to the edge of the tapping floor where it spills into huge ladles resting on flat cars. Ladle after ladle is filled until finally the laden train is on its way across the yard to its destination, the steel making departments, where the molten iron in the ladles will be poured into a large container called a mixer holding many tons and here kept hot so that it can be used in its molten state in one of the three major processes in making steel. Of these, the Bessemer converter process is the oldest for producing a tonnage product available at low cost for a multitude of uses. Here stand the operators in safety behind shatterproof glass. Number three is going to pour. One of the monsters, like a huge egg with a top sliced off, tips over on its trunnions and pours into a ladle its load of steel that glows like the sunset and shoots millions of sparks through the dim traceries of girders and all down the length of the arena. Very different from the spectacular Bessemer is the squat little electric furnace which makes special steels because of its smaller capacity and the ease with which it can be controlled so accurately. From this process come the high grade alloy steels such as stainless and all sorts of special steels with special qualities. And then there are the open hearths. While the roaring flame and fireworks from Bessemer converters still provide a thrilling spectacle, and capacity for producing steel in the electric furnace has been increasing in the last few years, 90% of steel today is produced in open hearth furnaces because of the demand for tailor-made steels in large quantities, which can be produced with this flexible and efficient method. And by the way, there is one interesting factor in the making of steel, just as important as the virgin iron fresh from ore smelted in the blast furnace. It is scrap. Most of the scrap metal will be found en route to the open hearth department, remelted scrap steel constituting about 50% of the total steel produced today. There's a carload of sheared ends. There's another. And there's a car that may hold all that is left of your 1929 automobile, now on its way to become part of a steel and a better steel, perhaps for your next car. In this huge structure, the open hearth floor, which is typical of American steel mills, a long line of furnaces holds steel in the making, steel that will someday enter your life, perhaps carry you safely on some journey, provide you with shelter, create an endless variety of comforts and conveniences. A supply of finely ground dolomite has been piled before the furnace that is to be charged. It will melt like glass and fill any holes that may have been burned through the lining by the previous heat, forming a solid bottom for the fresh charge. Then the charging begins. From the train load of scrap which has been brought close to the furnace, an electric charging machine lifts box after box 
and pushes its burden through the door of the furnace. The operator sitting at a safe distance, spinning the ram and dumping its load. There is the rumble of a giant traveling crane overhead, moving in with its burden. A huge ladle of molten iron from the mixer, where it has been awaiting this final step in the process of becoming steel. They are placing the chute into position for pouring the charge. And as the crane draws near, note that the men actually handling the metal are either sheltered high up on the crane in the cab or operate electrical controls across the floor. There goes the charge, 50 tons of white hot liquid metal heated to approximately 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Hazardous, frightful danger in this job, not at all. Millions of dollars have been spent by modern steel mills of America for safety. Devices are employed which not only protect the worker from molten metal, from metallic dust and from flying chips, but also from human carelessness. The of steel production has made work simpler and safer. Men are not doing dangerous jobs that the machine can do more safely but more men and more competent men are required to control the machine. And the safety achievement of the steel industry is a high tribute to the intelligence of these men who work in the mills. Like good cooks, they must know the temperature of the brew, and they measure it on an optical parameter while it boils in a white-hot pool as big as a fair-sized room. And like good cooks, they even take several samples of the brew using a long-handled small ladle to pick up enough liquid steel to cast a test ingot. It congeals almost instantly and is soon dumped out and handled quite readily. When it is cooled, it will go to the metallurgical laboratory for a thorough but quick examination before the metal from which it was taken is drawn off to be made into steel. Thousands of different kinds of steels are made like this every day. Each steel, strange as it may seem, a custom-built product each different steel, the filling of a prescription to bear certain, to be of a certain hardness, to be soft, flexible, dull, bright, to be tailor-made for each one of thousands of uses. Now they are ready to tap a big one, and they must reach across to the opposite side of the furnace to break through the clay plug tapping hole from the inside. But the place to see the spectacular part of the operation is on the other side of the open half furnaces where an asbestos clothed worker burns through the exterior of the clay plug tap hole with an oxygen torch. A few more ramming blows with a long tapping iron, and there she flows. 200 tons of steel produced according to specifications for one of an infinite variety of uses. Just the proper percentages of carbon and other elements are retained in every heat of steel so that it will possess the exact characteristics needed. Men on the platform will shovel in the correct amounts of Spiegel, ferromanganese, ferrosilicon, or whatever agent the metallurgical laboratory has prescribed for this particular heat of metal. Higher and higher it mounts in the great ladle, until the slag, the undesirable portion of the charge, rises to the top like froth, and overflows to find a future usefulness as a byproduct in other lines of business. The electric crane moves into line to carry the ladle to the pouring platform where a train of cars bearing the ingot molds is waiting. When this molten metal has been poured into molds, the basic business of making steel is ended. Thereafter, it is only a matter of fashioning from the ingots the form of product desired. The steel man says that this fiery liquid freezes immediately in the mold. He means that it congeals when its temperature goes down a thousand degrees or so, and within an hour is frozen too hard on the outside for rolling. Thus, it is not of a uniform consistency. So after the molds are stripped from the ingots, weighing from five to 15 tons apiece, the huge castings are hauled away to a furnace called a soaking pit, in which they are heated until of the same temperature throughout, and which holds them at exactly the right heat for the anvil of the modern blacksmith, the rolling mill. Now this steel is fairly on its way to you because in this one chunk of white hot metal, 
There may be thousands of cans, kitchen utensils, or perhaps the materials for automobile bodies, refrigerators, and innumerable things in everyday use. And this universal use of steel is possible because its cost is only two or three cents a pound, the lowest of any important metal. The wide strip continuous mill made it possible to provide sheet steel wide enough for the all steel automobile body and the one piece steel top on the models of today. It is one of the many great advances in the art of steel making, which has brought a saving to the consuming public in the form of lower prices for better steel amounting to nearly $300 million a year compared with costs of 10 years ago. Automobile users alone are saving $75 million a year. But in spite of ma more men are needed in the mills and employment is now at the highest level in the industry's history. There goes that ingot you saw, now a hot slab, flattened and elongated on its way to further reduction. Now reduced by further rolling to the size of armor plate. and now becoming a huge strip, several feet wide and less than a quarter of an inch thick. It moves to the table where it will await its turn in the coiling machine. Coiled hot, it is subsequently cold rolled flat after passing through an acid cleansing bath. Two processes which vastly improve the smoothness and polish of the surface before it is cut into the lengths prescribed by the factory to which it is to be delivered. In general, only the rarer metals such as gold or platinum have ever offered much resistance to corrosive attack until the steel industry developed stainless steels which have made this metal practical for an endless variety of uses wherein it combines beauty with resistance to rust and corrosion. Look at that polish, a permanent mirror-like surface, perhaps destined for some swanky cocktail bar or the kitchen of a modern home. Here is an operation which constitutes in itself a critical test of steel, the piercing of a solid billet to form a seamless tube. And here is another interesting operation, also a critical test of steel, the making of a car wheel. The wheel must retain its specification factors of strength and ability to take it when subsequently it will be pounding over the rails. On another mill, a big ingot begins to take form with a first rough rolling, becoming elongated as it passes through another roll, and then assuming a familiar shape as we see the outline of an H column, destined for some skyscraper or perhaps a great steel bridge. The operators of the mill, up there above it, and completely shut off from the heat of that white hot steel, turn it, spin it around, roll it by pressing buttons or throwing levers, and finally deliver it at the far end of the mill, a completely finished job. Steels pass through various mill processes or combinations of processes in order to make them suited to a wide variety of uses. In any giant ladle of molten metal, there may be steel that is destined to defeat time and distance, to provide the framework of mighty buildings, and to enter into the daily life of every citizen in thousands of things that provide comfort and convenience with economy. The call for steel from every section of America is a demand for a basic material without which life and living standards as we know them today would be impossible. Steel has kept pace with and anticipated the increasing needs of the nation. Men and steel provide a nation with its comforts, its luxuries and its progress. Well, that's it for this video. As always, thanks for watching.
please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. We really appreciate the support and it'll help us grow the channel and bring you more content.